I'm manipulating, uh, let's say, the narrative that people on the street have. Um, Stefan knows a lot about all these things. Uh, I think as far as I know, you did some crime research in your life. You did uh, search engine optimization, which might be the same thing somehow. <laughs> At least your, your LinkedIn profile say so. Um, you know, you did a lot of stuff with uh, media, IT, opinion, manipulation, and all these things. About me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you. Uh, so you have to be concentrated because my English is sometimes a little bit encrypted. So if you want to understand it, <laughs> uh, I hope you will then. Okay, so the idea today is to talk about the way uh, when there is cyber attack or some really uh, big event, sometimes attribution of that, I mean, origin of that event is made or is manipulated. Uh, so let's have some definition about uh, attribution to start. And uh, I like the, the second one here, which is like uh, to consider uh, as made by the one indicated, especially with strong evidence, but in the absence of conclusive, pr conclusive proof. So uh, which we are going to uh, observe in the different example I'm going to give you. And appropriation, uh, I will use it under the communication meaning. Appropriation is a fact to use the context of the situation for its own agenda. And this is one of the important parts which is related to the attribution. And uh, I like uh, even the, the definition of uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam Webster, which talk about a particular author or artist, because sometimes coder are artists. But uh, anyway, let's try to think about uh, two cases, which is the one is from uh, the plane which were taken down uh, in, uh, um, on, in Ukraine, uh, M17, and uh, the case of uh, Sony attack, which uh, happened recently, uh, just uh, before uh, Christmas and the end of uh, November. So uh, for the MH17 plane attack attribution, uh, the responsibility was given to uh, the Ukrainian separatists and uh, to, by uh, connection to the Russia. But uh, both sides are presenting kind of proof today that uh, is the uh, other side's responsibility. I don't know how many of you believe this is the Russia, which are like a kind of indirectly responsible, or whatever, this is a separate Ukraine separatist who uh, shut down that plane. How many of you believe that? Nobody? <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, suspicious then. <laughs> so, but um, I mean, in my own opinion, I don't have any idea to who did it. I mean, because. Uh, there is not only the fact the plane uh, were taken down, was taken down. This is a fact around that there is a lot of, I mean, uh, conflict of interest in that situation between both uh, camp involved. There is, a, on the one side, there is a Europe, there is a NATO, which have some really big interest uh, to the Ukraine. And on the other side, there is a Russia, which has as well a uh, strategic interest to the Ukraine and, of course, to the Crimea. So there is a lot of complexity around the situation. And uh, this fact to take down this plane can have several meaning or impact. So it is a highly emotional topic first, which are going to attract the attention on that conflict. It's just an observation. Uh, it can give a new way to the people to see that situation in Ukraine, to be influenced, because there is something that we call in French the more kilometers. I mean, uh, in the media, more uh, distance we, you have with the people who die uh, in the news uh, event, less you are uh, impacted emotionally. So more close you are from uh, what's happened, uh, according to the link to the people, to the nationality of the people, to the fact you are related to the people, more eventually involved you are going to be. So uh, this, of course, uh, have a big impact in terms of emotion. 
And uh, maybe for some, some people, it's more easy to understand the conflict by, I mean, having an idea who is the bad guy in that uh, conflict. And, uh, but what is important is still forensic evidences. That means uh, there is something which was collected on the site of the crash, which are still under analysis today. No information uh, like really uh, factual and given proof were uh, now released uh, officially. This is just uh, some picture about the impact of uh, uh, supposed to be a, a mass missile. And uh, in the future, still some new proof can come because some people maybe collected on the ground uh, of the crash. And uh, nobody knows who maybe have those proof in the end. So that means even if we forge a situation today, maybe in the future, we cannot make, it, make sure the situation won't be, I mean, uh, detected, identified as a forged situation. So today, this is another meaning that we cannot analyze only a situation, an event, uh, uh, something in the news by uh, the situation itself. We have to understand that everything has to be put in the context of the event and what that event will change in the future according to his perception. So we have to accept as well to not have an um, answer immediately because sometimes we can have scenari scenario of hypothesis and some element can validate that hypothesis and some element can unvalidate that hypothesis. It's just an idea of having a perception of the things, like who did it, Ukrainian government, separatists, you know, uh, for what kind of purpose, maybe they have done it, uh, because they were losing the war, just to manipulate opinion, or because it was a stupid mistake on the side of Ukrainian separatists, we don't know yet. And after we have to try to assess the situation with the pros and the cons. I have no answer to those cases, of course, because uh, I don't have more information than you, and uh, not more information what is publicly available. But uh, it's just an idea today, and sometimes we cannot have an answer to the end of the, when we have this exploratory scenario. But the fact is today, more and more uh, from, if we compare to before, the classical media are losing, you know, importance to, in the analysis of the situation by the people. That means the one who were giving a lead of, on understanding the situation are not the one we are taking into account in a priority today. More and more is the social media which is taken, taken into account. And then after came the conspiracy theory and after some time classical media. Like uh, for Ukraine, you have seen a lot of conspiracy theory after with a you know, picture of uh, uh, the passport from a camp to another. Some person said, oh, you look, the, the dead body, you know, they were arranged on the site, blah, 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 etc., etc." A lot of different uh, conspiracy theory. If you uh, just observe the recent event uh, in France uh, following the terrorist attack, a lot of manipulation were on the uh, social media with, uh, you know, photoshopped images, graphic, you know, uh, manipulated uh, images, graphically manipulated images, and everything, we change the, sit the perception of the situation. And uh, on that aspect, the classical media are always, like, late, you know, and are not the one who are uh, taking into account by the people to make their own opinion. So that means today opinion become uh, on the top of the perception and classical media on the bottom of it. And we can uh, observe in a lot of conflict today, governments start to use, I mean, like a sponsored tweet, you know, like to uh, put some money in the way to organize information within social media. It becomes a tool of influence uh, about the conflict, not forcibly on the site of, side, uh, site of the conflict, but sometimes for opinion which are outside of the conflict. Then, uh, 
This is another example how sometimes classical media are losing ground on that uh, aspect because uh, spin doctors, whatever they came from, I mean, there is spin doctor on the extremic side, there is spin doctor on whatever side, I mean, people who know communication and know how communication flow. And we have seen that because the media were using, um, I mean, those pictures provided by, you know, extremists, we were like just uh, using decapitation as a tool of emotion for the people to push people to feel emotion about it. Because then the media give an impact than uh, the, the extremists by themselves will be never able to give by just uh, uh, pushing that information without the support and the indirect help of the media. Then the media, I mean, create the attention to those images, what they shouldn't do uh, at the first uh, step. And after, of course, social media were in phases, all those things. I mean, everybody has a responsibility is sharing or diffusing, you know, spreading such information. And by doing it, we make, you know, part, we become part of the game of kind of instrument in the communication of some people who want to create uh, an emotion and influence among others. So let's talk about the problem of um, attribution uh, in a cyber attack. We have the case of Sony, which is quite interesting, and uh, I really uh, uh, advise you to go on uh, uh, riskbasedsecurity.com, uh, which have a really deep, deep uh, analysis of the case. So uh, at the 1st of December, I mean, on the beginning of December, attribution was given to North Korea by the FBI. But a little bit later, in December, uh, North Korea was not the one who were responsible according to the FBI, again. But a little bit later, FBI, you know, in the beginning of January, give again attribution to uh, the North Korea. But that attribution to the North Korea were really uh, contested by a lot of, I mean, security professional, and some other were supporting this ID. So, but even if there is no uh, publicly available evidences, you know, U.S. takes sanction against North Korea. That means only on communication. I mean, to the people, to the citizen, they didn't present any concrete proof. They said, yeah, we are convinced that uh, <laughs> uh, there is a North Korea behind this attack on Sony. And then they take sanction against uh, North Korea, and maybe, I, I have no idea if this is the case or not, because maybe they have launched a cyber attack against North Korea, because at the moment, North Korea have its uh, critical infrastructure affected by a kind of uh, cyber attack as supposed to. But uh, I cannot affirm this is like uh, US or whatever else who did it. But anyway, this is a new context where uh, a country can suddenly take several measures against another country under the supposition they maybe did something. These things, uh, I mean, will uh, lead us to uh, another aspect of the question, which, uh, uh, again, we can have like hypotheses, but no concrete things. But from that, what we can uh, maybe uh, think about. First, uh, proof can be any uh, easily forget manipulate on uh, digital uh, evidences. The right storytelling can help government to push their own agenda. More surveillance laws, more budget. You see immediately after the story in Sony case, uh, the Senate, I mean, Obama present in front of the Senate new laws or to improve some other existing laws and some other agency can request more budget to uh, improve surveillance and fight against the terrorism. This is always the counter effect we can see. We can observe that in the story of Charlie Hebdo as well. 
Now the French government said, okay, we are going to hire 2000, more than 2,000 new uh, employees for intelligence, you know, uh, purpose, and they are going to be uh, several new law to improve, I mean, the fight against uh, terrorists. Uh, since uh, Charlie Hebdo haven't uh, happened, I mean, more than 100 cases were open to apology of the terrorism. You know, that because people share online something, oh, I'm uh, against, uh, you know, these Charlie Hebdo things, and uh, I think they have done, uh, uh, the terrorists done it in a, uh, in a good way. This is an extreme example where people get in jail and sometime for like one year uh, uh, of jail. Or sometime it was just kind of, I mean, a uh, way to expre express it without forcibly, necessarily to support terrorists, and then he was as well uh, condemned uh, by the French uh, government. So, so, simply this show how suddenly situation change according to a specific event, and how politicians can capitalize on that event to change a context we before should, wouldn't accept, and because of the emotion of the event, we accept a lot of new things from uh, those politicians. Uh, so it, was, it, would, it will also quite convenient for Sony to not to talk too much about security failures because uh, we put the attention on North Korea and we don't put attention on the company and all the failures the company had, <laughs> you know, because, uh, I mean, its network was penetrated and every, all, all those information was told. I mean, and this is not the main topic uh, in the news. The main topic is North Korea. So the company have all the, um, the benefit of that situation. And, Again, keep in mind that it's an ongoing story and uh, nobody has the truth yet. We will see what's going to happen when uh, real evidence will be released, if one day it will. Because uh, according to the past attacks Sony have to handle, uh, some of those attacks are still not clarified yet today, and we still have no idea to who was behind those attacks in the past. So it doesn't mean uh, for that one we will going to have more information maybe in the future. So uh, the problem of attribution is the complexity of it. We can see here, which is a really nice graph, you know, which show a certain number of countries, like China, whatever, attacking other, you know, and, and so on. But uh, sincerely, uh, to have like a country, you know, with IP, <laughs> I, I don't think this is really uh, something we can believe in it, you know? And the problem today is like in most of the case, you know, media need just fact, you know? So, I mean, cyber security specialist or government tell them, oh, we identify this attack came from China, from North Korea, from whatever, from uh, USA, from France, from Switzerland, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, media publish that immediately behind. And then uh, after, you know, normal citizens, the one who don't understand what is an IP address or whatever, said, wow, this is a big uh, problem today. There is attack from those countries, those countries. We have to reinforce our security. We have to accept more constraint on security. We have to have, uh, accept more law in a way. Because uh, most of the people are not the ones who are sitting in that room, but is the ones who are just not caring really uh, deeply uh, about internet, they are just using it as a consumer. And then for those ones, we can really convince them about the fact we need more law and more you know, things uh, to fight this kind of, uh, this kind of things. So, which brings me to this declaration of the US Secret Secretary of Defense uh, in uh, October uh, 2012, and then uh, Mr. Uh, Panetta said uh, that, uh, of course, uh, the, the cyber threat facing by the U.S. you know are growing, and he said, uh, "Thanks God, is uh, on the cutting edge of this new technology. We are the best, and we have to stay there." Good for us that God is not uh, an expert in internet because <laughs> in that way we can maybe uh, challenge uh, uh, this kind of uh, statement. But uh, most important is what he said as, as well, potential aggressor should be aware that the United States has the capacity to locate and to hold them 
I couldn't take for action that might try to arm America. And this is an important, important declaration because he was following for several declarations about a different politician and uh, Obama did about the right to self-defense from uh, the US. But uh, sometimes we forget the past. Uh, in 1998, uh, it was a case where, again, uh, a US deputy defense secretary, John Arms, insisted that it was the most organized and systematic attack to date on US military system. But after a while, they identified this attack was from two, three person, young guys, you know, were playing with system because the system were really not really well protected. So between the affirmation made at the moment of the attack and the reality which was who was behind the attack, not a state, not an organi organized structure or whatever, just few kids, you know. And, and uh, this is really important because in, uh, when the statement uh, was made by this uh, US uh, deputy defense secretary, everybody was believing him, you know. Doesn't mean when uh, the reality of the situation was provided or was clear, I mean, all who first hear the declaration of the state uh, deputy uh, have that uh, knowledge of this manipulation. So uh, this is the, the, the reason why this notion of self-defensive force against cyber attack have really to be taken into account as an important matter today. Because uh, he raised several questions. I mean, according, in the add of the complexity of attribution of cyber attack, there is another, I mean, some other question we have to, to think about. First thing is like national sovereignty, geographical border over internet border doesn't really make sense. So I hear, uh, because I was invited to some conference, I cannot really mention uh, the, the, the background here, uh, where some uh, governmental representatives were attending, and it was that person uh, from a body close to the NATO really tried to make lobby about this concept of self-defensive uh, force, you know? And when I ask about you know, national sovereignty, uh, oh, I mean, uh, this concept will be over national sovereignty. That means a country won't have a sovereignty on its own, so own soil uh, if another country needs to defend itself and going through that country to attack another. So that means uh, it's quite, you know, make me worried about potential damage uh, or collateral, collateral damage uh, first to the network infrastructure, if uh, there is an attack by denial of services, you know, through a country, what that country, <laughs> you know, uh, is going to, to, to um, how is that country is going to manage it? Because uh, maybe it's just one of the relay of the attack, but uh, the country maybe needs its bandwidth, needs its infrastructure for its own purpose and normal purpose. And uh, suddenly, that country maybe is going to be affected for an attack which is targeted another country. Then, what's about uh, either if the one who gets attacked, you know, maybe uh, estimates that the country which was a relay is responsible as well of that attack, you know, and then respond to the country who are just a relay of the attack, not the source of the, uh, this, this, uh, this attack. There is another question. And uh, again, the potential uh, chance to lose control of the situation because uh, we are in an asymmetric world. That means uh, the response to an attack can be made from any country in the world which is connected to the internet by anyone who believes to be, I mean, uh, to have something to do with the attack, you know, to be not uh, in favor of it and to say that I'm going to show I'm not in favor of it and I'm going to respond to it from where I am, you know, to that specific country. So what will be the response in terms of self-defensive, you know, uh, concept 
to the people which can be disseminated among several countries to respond to an attack made to another one, you know? That means all this self-defensive force concept uh, doesn't make sense and it's really dangerous because the repercussion can, you know, uh, can be there for, for a long time and it doesn't mean we can manage a situation uh, after we launch a first attack for the reaction to that first attack by having like several other attacks. And uh, this is bring me to uh, the example of the, what did not, I wouldn't say Anonymous did that because Anonymous is like not one, not, it's just many person who just sometimes have like project. Some people maybe apply to some of the project and some other to apply to not. Uh, and some other apply to one, but not to the other. I mean, so it's difficult to say Anonymous did something. I mean, I like the idea of defending freedom of speech and so on. But what we can observe in that case, uh, specific case, uh, about attacking this extremist Islamist website. There is was like between 300 and 400 people involved on IRC, as I can observe uh, on those IRC which were uh, dedicated to the attack. But uh, most of those uh, people involved, you know, were not maybe speaking Arabic. So sometimes they identify website in Arabic, but maybe they are like not agreeing with us, <laughs> maybe uh, insulting us, maybe really criticizing us, but not maybe terrorist, you know? Like we can sometimes be critic against other, we don't share uh, our ID, but we have to accept some can be critic with ourselves, <laughs> you know, e as well. But maybe some of those websites are just critic uh, were putting down because people were believing they were like a promoting kind of terrorist. After the definition of the terrorism have to be discussed, you know, uh, but the terrorist is not when someone do not agree with us, <laughs> you know, or when we don't agree with someone. This is not question of, uh, you know, definition of the terrorist. So there is a, it was collateral damage. First day they, they shut down like, or oh, they, make some account to be closed. Uh, it was like, I guess, between 500 accounts on website together. But the response from people who feel attacked, who said, I'm Muslim, I feel attacked, or whatever, I'm Islamic, I feel attacked, or, or so on, were almost several thousand websites, which were not involved at all in this matter. I mean, the website who were attacked was website French website, website from schools, from university, some website from government, of course, but a lot of collateral damage were made by the first attack from uh, this little branch of uh, Anonymous. So uh, this might bring us to another way to think. Uh, first, today is really uh, a matter to understand who is behind the mask. Doesn't mean anonymous, you know, but the question of the mask today is really convenient to be used by anyone on the internet because of the complexity of the attribution in terms of cyber attack. I mean, it could be state-sponsored actor, you know, it could be non-state-sponsored actor, it could be hackers, it could be cyber mercenary. Anyone can wear a, a mask, you know. An intelligence agency can wear a mask claiming to be a hacker team to attack another country to uh, maybe get some information they can use in a diplomacy area, in strategic area, in competitive area to promote maybe their own uh, company and to give a competitive ad advantage to them. It could be uh, otherwise, maybe <laughs> whatever. I don't know, Germany can have a, like a, a mask with a kind of claim hacker team uh, stealing data in the Swiss bank and arguing after someone from a Swiss bank sell, uh, you know, a CD-ROM with all these customers from Germany. <laughs> Why not? You know, everything is possible in that world. But uh, the way to be able to identify this kind of thing today is really uh, not something not easy. So that means 
we really have to take some distance when we claim that an attack is originated by someone or someone else. And this is a task of the media as well. So this brings us to another problem, which is like the way uh, today we can identify the way people behave. At the beginning of the, of the presentation, I show you the problematic of the way social media take importance today in the understanding of the people according to whatever event happened on the earth. So that means, according to the fact, we have a lot of knowledge about the way people work in uh, sociology, psychology, neuroscience, and we have all these big data today, which are really good help to better understand people's behavior and to predict according to the fact we are going to bring to them, how they're going to behave analyzing that fact after all, you know? So that means we can really, by having those knowledge, to modify perception and opinion by anticipating. So that means this is like all the slides which were extracted from, I mean, a Snowden leaks. Uh, it's quite interesting to at least think about. I cannot say or whatever if they really came from the GCHQ or not, but it looks like the presentation. So we have as well to challenge PowerPoint, whatever it came from, if it came from Colin Powell or came from Snowden, we have to think about the hypothesis. Maybe it can be true or maybe it cannot, you know. But anyway, we can see uh, we have notion of a deception which are used by understanding all the way we react to information and what makes us to react or what makes us not uh, to react. So, uh, this is another aspect of the things which are not directly connected to our like pyramid of needs, you know? And all those things, maybe we take them with less attention sometimes, and we are more maybe uh, being manipulated by some news because we don't pay attention to those news and we don't want to read it uh, properly. So, this is one of the things which appear uh, in the emails which were leaked by the attack against Sony, which is quite interesting. It's a little fact, really little fact. But it's quite interesting. You have a government who want to influence the scenario of a movie to make it appear to be different. So just imagine <laughs> about all the movie. Uh, in US, as far as I know, if you want to benefit from the help of the army when you make uh, something with war, you have to give the scenario first to be read and to be accepted. So that means cinema is a really good tool of influence and TV series is the best one. I mean, when you have like a um, Pearl Harbor movie, it totally changed the story of the things, the way the things happen at the first, you know, as the first time. But how many of those young Americans just have seen the movie and never, you know, looks for the real story behind it? So that means it's a really question of our reading grid uh, about all those things and how people can make the difference between sometimes what is in movie who can forge an ID, influence someone, and the reality uh, in our society. So if we keep going on those slides from GTHQ, uh, they are based on, like you can see, the big uh, area, like, uh, I mean, psychology, deception, uh, uh, performance, media, and everything. And those we have now to really not analyzing only uh, information on the moment, because all those elements can be provided uh, by someone who wants to organize a specific way to perceive an information, then to analyze that information only is not enough. We have to have new uh, marks to maybe identify where an information is a little bit manipulated. What that information can change according to a specific context to the future one, you know? I was talking sometime with journalists who were talk, uh, in contact with people from intelligence agencies, and they said to me, some of them said to me, uh, when uh, 
someone from intelligence agency give me an information, I try to think about not what that information it is only, but what it will change in the future. Because when I'm going to publish it, I'm going to change the reality of something. So, I mean, maybe those guys from, you know, uh, intelligence agency give it to me in pur on purpose to make that reality to be changed, making me believe, oh, I'm a really elected person who can benefit this really insider, you know, things. So this is another uh, thing to take into account. And according to that, education will be definitely the best tool to try to understand the way opinion and the way information is built today. Improving our, improving our knowledge uh, to their knowledge, because today they are in advance on us. So we have to, to, you know, to, to, to try to, to fill the gap uh, to that and to make people understand how we can manipulate information and what information, how information can modify our perception. So people have to be taught uh, how to learn, you know, uh, to have this criti critical look or critical distance to those information which can be accessible online. I mean, understanding the way to read social media and to read, I mean, whatever, you know, complotist theory sometime there, to analyze it, to try to defeat it by finding, you know, uh, information which can uh, compete with uh, what people want to make you believe, you know? It's like reading Wikipedia, reading a video, reading images, you know, all these things who can be modified, you know? Wikipedia is like, uh, in Switzerland, a lot of teachers criticize Wikipedia because there is mistakes, there is false information. Yes, this is true, sometimes. But, you know, teaching students how to, I mean, correct mistake, misspelling or whatever, how to understand what is a false information, you know, is making them aware of that, you know, <laughs> and uh, to be opposed to Wikipedia is not a solution. And understanding that like, uh, encyclopedia like Wikipedia have several levels of reading. There is a level which is a consensus of the people, which is an article. There is a level where people talk about their article. And there is a level where there is a history with an IP address, uh, identified identifiable account which contribute to Wikipedia, a lot of people contributing to an article, few people contributing to an article, every, all those things have an importance in the way to read information and to understand it. But how many people today can understand these kind of things? How many people know how to read a URL today? I mean, a URL is 20 years, you know, the web exists, <laughs> and still today most of the people cannot read a URL. It's not a technical thing is a path to an information, you know? And identifying the path to an information is really important. Even journalists, part of the journalists sometimes do not understand really what is the URL. When we can just observe how many phishing still work today, <laughs> we can understand why, <laughs> you know, there is a big problem uh, today. It's like metadata, metadata in images, you know? I can, I have a, in some of my presentation for journalists, uh, I can use my mobile phone with a specific tool to modify my GPS location. So I take a picture in my wall based with my GPS based in a city in Syria. After I extract that picture on my computer, I have this program to extract the metadata, exif data from my picture. I extract the metadata, I go on Google image, I look for uh, the body of the wounded children somewhere, you know, I don't care. I have the picture of the body of the wounded children. I inject those metadata I take from the picture <laughs> with my modified GPS in it, and then I have a picture with the wounded children located with the GPS data in Syria, you know? And, uh, okay, I'm going to send it to whatever a journalist saying, oh, I cannot really prove that picture is true, but believe me, it is. Knowing the journalist is going to look at the metadata and saying, oh, he didn't mention the metadata, so maybe he don't know. <laughs> so uh, having the metadata will, for me, give credibility to the image. But I knew what he's going to do first, you know. Then uh, I can try to anticipate this kind of thing. All those things is quite easy today. And for people who know a little bit technology, it looks like, I mean, so obvious. 
But uh, the problem is most of the people do not understand technology, do not understand metadata. They don't understand with metadata we kill people today, <laughs> you know, like uh, some US representative was saying, you know. So this is all those things are really important is a way to read information today. And this is almost the end of my presentation about this way to think because we sometimes don't know who we have to fight first, terrorists or government. I mean, because a government uses the fear of terrorists to uh, finally, finally restrict our freedom, saying they are restricting our freedom. To avoid them to restrict our freedom, they have to restrict our freedom themselves. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who has to do it uh, finally in a way, in another. So, I mean, uh, terrorism is real. This is not something I contest, you know. I don't, I'm not like having uh, so much uh, peaceful this, uh, speech saying, oh no, there is not, everything is made by government. No, there is a real problem. And uh, there is extremists in, in our world who don't want, my, uh, you know, to accept the world the way it is. But doesn't mean we don't, we cannot think. Doesn't mean we, are, we have to accept everything which the way it is provided to us by the government saying, oh, look at the situation, we have to fight better, so accept everything. No, maybe we have to think a little bit differently and a little bit deeply about the things. Like more surveillance law do not improve fight against terrorism because we can uh, notice, we can observe for the last case, like, like in France, case I, I know more or less quite well, from Charlie Hebdo, from um, Mera, another, I mean, a terrorist attack against uh, Jew school and so on, the information was existing, you know? It's like for the 11 September attack. Information was existing. It was not shared in a good way. The, uh, intelligence agency were not collaborating well. I mean, people were not doing their work well. It's not question of the law. It was question of the way to process information, you know, not of the, of the legal framework which was not adapted. And sometimes we have the feeling we try to replace uh, competencies by more law. Doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, we have to improve competency. I mean, we, I mean, uh, it makes sense to have intelligence agency to fight terrorism and everything. It, make, it makes sense to have means to do that. But it doesn't make sense to respond to that problem by having more law, you know? So it's like the notion of legal design technology. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, Bundes Trojaner, you know? We have this debate in Switzerland actually and what happened with uh, Charlie Hebdo terrorist attack is immediately after several politicians look said, you know why now we need this new law on intelligence agency, giving more mean to intelligence agency, allowed them to use Bujan, uh, Bundes uh, Trojaner for their own purpose. In a sense, it's true. They need more means. They need to be able to be to infiltrate forum, you know, like uh, internet uh, people, whatever. But uh, what is the problem with Bundes Trojaner? What I'm talking about when I said legal design technology, when the code has to respond to the legal framework, because usually now what people want to citizen to accept is like we have a, a Trojan and we can use a Trojan to infect a computer. But the Trojan itself doesn't have any brain, you know? It can affect the computer of this presumed terrorist or cyber criminal or whatever criminal. But it can infect the computer of his wa the wife or the husband of the policeman or the you know, intelligence agent or whatever. So we have to set the code and the technology in a way there is still democratic control. We have to have a judge who give the key to activate the software, you know? And we have to another key to make an identifier. We can make uh, people able to know where this software was used and for which purpose, you know? And to identify who were access to that software. Because those tools are really powerful today. Then we have to keep control on those. And uh, this is not the case actually. So human have to be protected against itself because Sometimes I have to manage cases, you know, could be revenge porn, could be 
whatever. And some people having really important function in government where sometimes or whatever agency where could be involved in some of the case. That means sometimes human become unrational when is like connected to emotion or to feeling, you know? So it should be a civil society kind of democratic control as well uh, on the work of intelligences, you know? And especially on the quality of the data stored in intelligence database. I mean, this is a main, for me, is one of the main uh, goal today or important goal today is to know what kind of information can be uh, stored in that database. Because even if I would be like uh, saying, oh, we need to access to all the database and to all the information about people or whatever. But if there is wrong information or not qualified properly, properly qualified information in that database, when they will need those information, they will make mistake on the scenario of understanding what that information mean. So we are going to lose time, energy, maybe life of people, by not be able to understand properly what that information means because it was not collected and stored on a really uh, evaluate, assess quality. I mean, and uh, integrity and everything. So that means so, that mean the importance of understanding the quality of information in those databases is not to resposing, um, ah, not to trusting too much a technology like we see NSA is doing. NSA is collecting everything, whatever it could be, and believing after they can make, you know, loop and connect it to people, to uh, past information and so on. But we know all those information can be manipulated or can be give a wrong message. But all this way to analyze will be time and energy and money, which are not going to lead on to efficiency. So this is a big problem we have to manage uh, as well. And uh, just to remind that whatever, you know, based on just some information, even people who we believe they are trained and they are, I mean, professional can make mistakes. This happened in Germany years ago. He was presented at the Chaos Computer Club in 2007, uh, if I remember well. And it was quite terrifying when you hear the testimony of the girlfriend of this guy who was like uh, arrested because he left his mobile phone at home when he had to meet someone and he meets someone we were involved in the past in a consider as a terrorist act and so on because he burned some military, a US military truck S seems to be like uh, years ago. And then under this like seen information, this guy was put it in jail, you know? And after the couple was really under surveillance, a deep one, you know, like uh, they called to each other, say, oh, bring the, the bag uh, with you uh, when we meet. And when they were together, they, someone said, oh, what is your new bag? <laughs> like, uh, kind of, uh, of uh, stressful. So that means we have enough examples from the past, like there was mistake. And we have to improve you know, competencies to avoid those mistakes because those mistakes have effect on life of the people. They are not digital mistakes, you know. They are mistakes which can affect the life of the people. Then, uh, to finish, and um, thank you for your attention, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I, I will let you with this uh, cut from uh, Al uh, Albert Einstein about knowledge, learning, and uh, using the mind uh, on thinking, because uh, this is a way to challenge information, to challenge what you receive as an information, to challenge official media, and to challenge what we have over uh, social media, and so on. And to maybe try to have this perception of a new education needs uh, we should provide to people today. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I will be glad to answer to your question. I hope my English was not too bad to make myself understandable. <laughs> Um, Gilles Bordelais, je vais parler en anglais quand même pour tout le monde. <laughs>
Um, so I think um, as a pirate, there's something in your talk that you definitely want to look into because I think this is a fundamental flaw in the logic. Um, yes, there are things that can be done wrong while analyzing the data, but the answer to this is not beta, better data, at least if you consider this as a, as a societal decision or a political one, it's less data. We want to stop, at least as a, as a, as a lawmaker, we want to impose uh, limits on how much data can be collected and what can be done with it. The answer is not improving the data because basically this can't be done and um, basically we know enough already. Um, you're just using the metadata with, of your phone, like where you've been. We can already tell you if you're about to get a cold. Mm. Um, that's enough precision, basically. We can already predict the future with what we have, um, more or less accurately, but actually more. So um, it's just plain wrong to accumulate so much data uh, on people that we not only know what they do, but what they're going to do. So this is what I absolutely has got to stop. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I have, I have no problem with that. I mean, uh, for me, I try to, you know, I try to be really open in my speech to show there is not my, my main concern. I mean, I do agree with you, but my main concern is the efficiency of the people. And if the people improve their efficiency in analyzing information, I think as well there is enough today to maybe to fight whatever I have to fight. I mean, uh, cyber criminals, cyber terrorists, terrorists, and whatever we can call the, the threat, the threat we have to fight. There is enough information to fight it. Maybe, I, I, of course, there is no need of new law in some country because not all the country are the same. Law have to be adapted to certain things. But uh, doesn't mean we have to collect more data neither. Uh, maybe I make my, myself not uh, quite understandable on that point, but uh, what I want to promote is to say, my message is like, be careful to not give the lead to technology compared to the efficiency and the level of knowledge of the people who have to, I mean, intelligence people or whatever, you have to fight terrorists and so on. This is not going to replace competency. <laughs> Information and technology are not going to replace the competency, will be the message. You called for legally designed software, and we do have a legal framework in Europe, as far as I know, which should make it almost impossible to design software which is different, which is not legal, because it's forbidden to do things according to data protection, security, default by, um, design by, uh, safe design by default. That's not the right term, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the problem is more power than the, the legal requirements, because power will prevent this happening. There will be commercial power, there will be political power, military power, and we will be forced to work with software, which is not safe. That was one point that I'm, I'm very worried about, even though in your talk you tried to sort of keep that worry out of the picture. And the other point is, I don't know whether you heard about Pegida. When, yeah. okay, when you hear interviews with the attendants of the demonstrations, you will find out that they do not want to look at information the way you suggested that we look at information, putting it into a context and looking at who's, to whose benefit it might be lanced on, on our, in our media. Yeah, I mean, but... Uh, technology, even if it's legally, is like, I mean, what, things which are not allowed by the law are not taken into, in, not taking into account by the people who are supposed to follow the law. I mean, like policemen, you know, intelligence agency people, or whatever. Maybe they're going to take 
the freedom of use that software in another context is why we have really to give less, 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 to give them less freedom to do it by having, you know, certain, you know, like wall to avoid misuse of it because we know by advance they are going to misuse it. <laughs> You know, is try to reduce the risk. I cannot avoid it, but uh, just having a law do not match. We have to put that law in the code, in a way. I want to add something to the last uh, question. Um, uh, how do you want to deal with uh, the problem of uh, filter bubbles? Uh, I think the uh, Pegida people, they, they are living in there. You probably know the term uh, filter bubble, don't you? Uh, not sure. <laughs> a fil filter bubble is uh, yeah. a term uh, coined, I think, by a scientist uh, called Ali, Ali Pariser. Um, it uh, describes the phenomenon that uh, people uh, live in online communities that reinforce their beliefs. So they, yeah. they uh, live in... I understand every, what you mean. Every, yeah. Everyone uh, lives in a bubble of uh, opinions. Um, yeah that uh, confirm your own uh, belief and there is no uh, public opinion anymore. Uh, yeah. And um, how do you want to deal with uh, this problem? Um, so mass, mass media has uh, less and less influence and uh, um, more and more people uh, are getting uh, news about the world from their friends and so from their filter bubble. I mean, this, what we can observe is not new, you know. Uh, before, there, is, there was trolls uh, around the world. It was always trolls. I mean, uh, people who are trolling, uh, whatever, uh, everyone or every content on the internet and so on. But internet allowed them to be together, even if they are separate by thousands of kilometers, which was not the case before. So, I mean, stupid people can be together today by the way of uh, online technology. But uh, education is a result of something. I mean, we are failing for me with education because what we see on the internet is the um, society mirror of what we are in a way. I mean, in our society, there is those people who exist and have this strong belief based on whatever irrationality. So we have to work again from the bottom and not believing we can change those who are already with a conviction because they don't want to change. They are comfortable with that because they have, like you said, in the bubble they are friends. Sometimes they are going to insult or to promote anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim, whatever, not because they really believe in it, but to reinforce the link with a friend, <laughs> saying, oh, look, I, I did like you, you know, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm totally against those Muslims, whatever, so we have to be better friends because of that, you know? <laughs> Sometimes this like, stupid way to, to react is uh, something we have to take into account. But uh, to, to try to answer to your question is, for me, I don't see anything else that going back to the school and trying to make people able to have a better reading of information, understanding, I mean, this case of Charlie Hebdo, this case of uh, Pegida, have to be studied at the school to really uh, decrypt how it is done, you know? We cannot save everyone. It's like in our society, there is a percentage of people we are a specific way, you know? Like, there is a percentage of psychopaths, they were born like that. A uh, percentage of schizophrenic people without to put any relation. Whatever, you know, some people you cannot save. So some people are born like that, you know. And some people in Pegida, you cannot do anything about, you know. Education or whatever will not give any positive answer to what they feel and the way they perceive the world. But for uh, some other, we can do something by education. And this is why in the education is... At, in my perception, but uh, like I said at the beginning, is a collective intelligence exercise. So in my perception, is the best things is education because we can save part of them. When I, I have to do a prevention in the school about cyberbullying and everything like that, when I try to make understand to the people, it could be a sister, it could be a brother which is victim of cyberbullying, and what they have to feel, you know, how those people can feel it, how they can uh, psychology, you know, be 
impacted by it, sometimes, you know, some of those people realize something they were not realizing before. And some of them maybe are going to change because they were not thinking before that, they were not thinking, they were thinking it's fun to cyberbile people, you know, because they are doing with others. But sometimes they can change of opinion. So I have nothing, unfortunately, nothing else to provide, you know, in terms of uh, answer. So we have two more short questions. First here. Uh, the problem with attribution is not only in the cyber war in military topic, but also in law enforcement. For example, we have uh, judges who uh, pinpoint criminals on IP addresses, and we have the European Commission in preparing a new draft for data retention. Um, and the problem of, of attribution uh, should be addressed there too. Do you know of uh, prominent examples of um, uh, false attribution for example, uh, when the French president was uh, sus was um, um, a victim of the three strikes uh, in in, Fra in France, there were like um, internet shutdown uh, threats to the pr president's office because there was like file sharing in his office. Um, do you know as uh, um, um, as like um, false attribution examples which could be used uh, to argument against um, data retention? Yeah, I mean, so this problem can lead to any situation. In sense, uh, if the one day we can really have a real way to prove who did something, you know, but uh, it's not the case. And today, the problem is technology bring us uh, in the way to we are forced to demonstrate we are not guilty. Instead, the justice to demonstrate we are guilty, which was uh, before it was. Uh, the job of the justice or the law enforcement to prove we are guilty on something. Today, if you are belonging to a group on WhatsApp, uh, you are guilty, potentially guilty, by the fact you accept to be in that group, even if you never exchange a message with other members, but you are going to be interviewed by the police. I have the case of a college student <laughs> where she was in a group where someone was selling marijuana, <laughs> And she was here by the police, and she asked me, but is, why, you know? I said, because we are in the group. You are linked by the technology, even if you were like, uh, just not be aware you were in that group, not looking at the message, and not even knowing, like people were selling marijuana, you are for the justice, you are linked by the technology, then you are potentially guilty of something. And today we have to demonstrate you are not guilty. And it's not the justice to make the work, you know, of demonstrate you are guilty uh, and then, and according to all the other consideration of the easy way to f fabric face proof, like a DNA, like, uh, I mean, not only cyber uh, is, is concerned, but uh, that mean, again, less efficiency, more and more, and more responding on the use of technology or whatever can be technology, it could be DNA or whatever, oh, is the DNA, Oh, we, we don't have to think about anymore. DNA is proof enough, you know, but it can be manipulated. I mean, and, and uh, this is, I, I have still no answer <laughs> to these things for the future because uh, it's really to, to challenge a society in which you are according to the way to balance the power of the technology and the understanding those people have because I have no idea how the people are trained in the intelligence service. Uh, the people in the police they are like in between several generations, and not all are really savvy in the use of technology. Some of them maybe are, are going to understand it, some others are going to take it like a, a religion, you know? I don't know. So this is another problem. How broad uh, must the education be, and how can you uh, be successful by uh, promoting education and um, changing the politics <laughs> in this way? Or do you think, okay, the politicians are doing their business anyway, so we can ignore them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, this is a big problem. Uh, it's the same problem we have in Switzerland. I mean, the politics are not educated. The one we are in the commission, which are specialized according to like uh, the one who have to watch the intelligence services, are commission of politician, not commission of expert, which are doing politics. <laughs> you know, which is a big difference. I mean, the politician which are sit in that commission do not really have 
Fourthly, all do not really have the expertise in the matter of intelligent service, the way they work, the way they should work, you know, to ch control them. So if you are controlled by someone who don't know what is your job, you know, the control cannot be efficient. So that means uh, the politician is the one who takes the deci de decision about financing education and everything. But the citizens are the ones who are electing them, <laughs> in a way. But uh, the problem is the mainstream citizen do not care or do not, do not understand those uh, stake in related to education, and we are going to lose time still uh, for years, maybe, uh, to achieve something which will be, I mean, going back in education and train people in a proper way. Uh, otherwise, except having like democratic tool like uh, petitions, like a referendum, like things like that to, to find enough people who are agreeing with the fact education need to be redefined on the side of information technology and this kind of awareness I was describing, it will be difficult because otherwise if you don't find those people who accept to be mobilized for that, how do you want you know, these things going on the politician side and after on the educational side and after on the teacher. I don't know in Germany, but in Switzerland, we don't have like uh, what he said, the specific one central place where teacher can access to the specific knowledge they should have according to, uh, to the information technology and the internet and everything. Neither the one student should have to be comfortable in our uh, today's society. We have some part which exists in some area, but nothing is centralized, nothing is like uh, based on a strategy of saying oh, we have to, to, to improve the knowledge of those teachers by giving them several points they have to you know, assimilate to improve their knowledge. We don't have that yet. <laughs> So that means this is, should be the work of the politician, but because the politicians are not aware of that, it's like a vicious circle. <laughs> uh, maybe we have to, to wait for a generation, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I have no answer for most of the questions <laughs> in certain way. I can observe. <laughs> Questions, just follow him outside.